I don't think my art does represent me at all. I think people, people say that because they know me and they'll say, oh yeah, you know, like I can see your crazy mind or whatever, you know, all this stuff. They always say stuff like that. But I think that my art more so represents what's around me. That represents a spectrum of things as opposed to being like, this is my opinion on something. This is what I see. And if my work is about understanding everybody's spectrum and how all of these things influence us as people, then why would I limit myself and my own practice? Drawings are the most expressive form of art because it's this sort of like visual, textural, you have to like be visceral with it or you can be soft or whatever. Whereas a painting, it's, there's a disconnect between the brush, the paint and the canvas or whatever you paint on. I guess my primary practice these days is a painter, but figuring out how to make all of my works in general look like drawings. Like a drawing on paper can only do so much. It's usually really small and personal and it feels kind of like, like you're looking at someone's diary almost like, and to take it to a bigger scale like a painting, it becomes this sort of combative thing where when you're looking at a painting, it's like speaking to you depending on the size. And so I started doing paintings more because I wanted to push myself out of my comfort zone. And now I've even started taking my paintings and destroying them and putting them out in nature to let nature destroy them because I've gotten bored with painting paintings because painting a painting is is so, is limiting within the confines of what you're painting on. I like the idea of how a painting is an expression of a moment and it's kind of a response to something. So if I find a photograph or a drawing or, or whatever, and then I paint it, it's kind of like a combination of like all of these things in one object. And then once you take that object and place it somewhere else, it becomes a different object. I kind of fell into making artwork or like making what you would call artwork. I was trying to figure out who I was. And so I just started scribbling, like just, just scribbling. And um, at first it didn't make any sense. It was just drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing and drawing. Somehow an art school was like, oh, okay, sure, you can come here. And I was like, all right, cool. And then I dropped out because it wasn't really my thing. And then I didn't really make art for a while. Um, but when I was in high school and stuff, I always drew and tried to do artistic stuff because my dad's an architect. Whenever I would do it, like the teachers would be like, what are you doing? They'd confiscate my books and shit like that and be like, you know, oh, can I curse? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah. <laughs> the dirty words, yeah. okay. So anyway, so yeah, I would do stuff like that and um, they would just take my books and like send them to the principals and the principals would be like, what are you doing? Like, you know, you should focus on this and focus on that. So um, I don't know, art in Cayman has always been kind of something that has been pushed away from people, like creativity in general. When I came back from art school, I was like back in a community that didn't even want art or didn't really appreciate art properly. Tried to go to school again, didn't work. Tried to go to school for like accounting, which is like really boring. And quickly realized that that wasn't for me. But even the most prominent artist of Cayman's history, Bendel Hides, didn't even live in Cayman. There was a feeling of like this sort of, like, what do I do here? Like, do people understand it? You know, people question why you're making it. And he was dealing with that back when there was like almost no art in Cayman. Even him and other artists had such a hard time. And then the Native Sons came around in the late 90s. They had more, you know, acceptance. I think as more foreign influence came to Cayman, more people started to be like, all right, well, you know, art is this and art is that. Fast forward to my generation of artists where I'm pretty much the only artist my age practicing, like a full-time practice in Cayman, it's pretty difficult. I mean, there are other artists my age that practice arts, but I'm the only one with like a full-time studio and it's my full-time job. Most of my work starts at one stage and then it kind of, because I have ADHD, so, Everything just kind of goes and eventually I come at like find one place where it's like, all right, this is what I was trying to do like six months ago. My studio is a little bit cleaner than usual. There's usually a lot of papers all over the walls, which is ideas. 
I'll take photos of people from like two years ago and then finally make something of it like two years later because to me um, memories have a charge like a sort of physical and emotional response to seeing something like if you take a photo of somebody and you forgot you even took the photo of them when you see it again it's going to have more of a, an experience than if you were constantly looking at it and um, to me I think the process of finding something new while you're doing something that you've never done before is like more instantly rewarding than just being like, oh, this is my plan and I planned this and I did that and that's how it came out. And also you lose that spontaneity. There's no conceptual contemporary galleries in Cayman. We sell seashells or we're the National Gallery, that's it. I was just kind of like, well, where do I show my work? And I kept thinking about that and I just realized that there's all of this nature around me that no one uses. There's no trespassing laws in Cayman. Unless they tell you to leave, then you have to leave. So I was like, I could put it anywhere, right? I thought about Barker's because it's near my house. I live in West Bay, so I was like, okay. And then I was like, I don't know if I want to put a painting yet. I was still kind of trying to figure that out. So I was like, all right, let me take a print, like a poster. Every time I go to New York, I see all these posters. Like they take wheat paste and they just and they stick the poster to the wall and that's illegal, but they do it anyways. I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna have to install the wood out in the bush because there's nowhere to like put this poster. I got a grant from Catapult, which is um, AFJ, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk to make this project that I made in Barker's. And at the time, it was just about a video thing. I just put two cameras out there, put it out in the bush, and I filmed me and my dad. Um, placing them out there because I had watched uh, Frank Ocean's Endless album and I just thought it was crazy how Frank Ocean just took an album, didn't even put a single, you can't buy the songs, you have to buy the video to listen to the songs. So I was like, all right, cool. And I thought about the idea of just making this space that didn't make any sense because what I was doing didn't make sense at the time to me, like putting artwork out in a bush, like doesn't make sense. So I figured I'd film it like that. That was the video and that was it. And it was just... Uh, color studies that I do for the paintings that I do and I just put them on the piece of wood and that was it. And then like a month later, it was like my whole phone started blowing up. People being like, you know, F you, F this, blah, blah, blah. You're a murderer. Oh, these are tombstones for women. Who would do this? Why would you do this? This is nature. This is ugly. This is an art. A couple of weeks after that, someone went out there, took white paint and just went, censored it. And I was just like, okay. Whatever. And I told people, go do whatever you want to it. And then the National Gallery heard about it. They had a biennial show and they were like, oh, can we put it in the biennial show? And I was like, sure, I guess. To me, it was weird because the work had gone full circle at that point. Like it was created because I had no galleries and now the National Gallery is hanging it up. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, it's just destroyed now. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. I'm not sure if I've yet found what what the main influence would be for Cayman influencing me. I think that, um, I think the main influence is that I feel like my whole life I was um, sort of censored in like every aspect. And I think that uh, censorship or um, sort of suppression of any sort of sense of self, I think is a thing that a lot of modern Caymanians deal with. And so I think that no one really discovers who they are as people because the country itself is still trying to figure out who the people are within the country. So I think that primarily right now, my whole feed of information is just trying to figure that out. And once I figure that out, um, maybe then I can start to make work that's more like, I guess, romanticized. I think that a lot of artists in the past have looked at like very typical like exoticism things like, oh, the sea is blue and maritime heritage and they romanticize all of these classical notions of like what came out was like rose colored glasses and I think that not to say that it's not necessary but also that it's not the reality of today so I don't think I think it's the artist's job or the the creator's job to make something that is indicative of the time as opposed to like romantic notions so I still haven't figured out what Cayman means to me yet, but I'm trying to figure that out through my work.
we really should be developing a cultural identity and not just saying like, oh, there's a parrot down the street. I'm a parrot. Like that's one dimensional. You're selling yourself short potentially for like what you could be. So yeah, I think it drives me nuts. Like honestly, I think about it all the time. It's like three, four, five till I die. That is the area code that is designated for phones. Art changed where I was at. I think it gave me some form of purpose, like just making and doing and creating stuff like express myself and also to hear other people's stories and like what's going on with them. And I feel like these are all things that I wouldn't have had access to, like had I gone the typical route or whatever people are supposed to do in Cayman or whatever they're supposed to do to put money on the table. And I'm not saying that like, I take this as a, like a luxury or like something because it's still like, it's not that easy. Just the fact, I think the main thing that brings me joy in any of this is actually when people see something and I can genuinely see that they're like enthused or like it made their day or like it actually spoke to them in a way that I can't even speak to you or speak to anybody. Like artwork speaks to people at a level that like I don't even know. Like it's like almost quasi spiritual. It's like you're just like, well, it is spiritual. So. I think to me that's the most important thing is like when kids or like grown adults that have no experience with art have this moment of like eureka, like euphoria, like damn, I don't get it. And I think, I don't know, I think that that's what keeps me making art too is because I don't get why I make anything. So I just keep, every day is like a new day for me. And so when people actually see that through the work, I think that's what kind of keeps me like making stuff so anytime I see a young person making art or see someone who says I don't really understand that but I like it I try to encourage them rather than say like oh you don't get it or oh you, sh you won't get it or any kind of thing like that because at the end of the day you can't really art is subjective you can't really define what is art and what isn't art so to me um, the only way to develop a community in, in a place where there is no community is to allow it to grow and foster itself naturally Peace.